back, everyone. This afternoon's debate is on the motion, this house believes that virtual hearings are just as effective as in-person hearings. Arguing for the motion are Mr. Gary Bourne, president of the SIAC Court of Arbitration and chair of the International Arbitration Practice Group at Wilmer, Cutler, Pickering, Hale, and Door LLP, and Ms. Joy Tan, joint head of the Commercial and Corporate Disputes Practice, the Corporate Governance and Compliance Practice, and the Financial Services Regulatory Practice at Wong Partnership LLP. Arguing against the motion will be Mr. John Bong, member of the SIAC Court of Arbitration and head of international arbitration at Bay Kim and Lee LLC, Mr. and Mr. Rob Palmer, managing partner of the Singapore office of Ashurst LLP. This session will be moderated by Mr. Edmund Cronenberg, managing partner at Bradel Brothers LLP. After the debate, the outcome will be determined by the participants by way of a vote. Mr. Cronenberg, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And I hope you had a good lunch. We're gonna be in for an exciting and interesting debate, hopefully. Uh, we've got everybody geared up. Um, I'm just gonna give you the rules uh, before we go ahead. Uh, each speaker is going to have 15 minutes. Uh, there's gonna be a five minute re rebuttal on each side. And we're then gonna have a, a Q and A segment where you can pose questions to the speakers uh, from your point of view. Um, we'll have about 10 minutes for this. And then we'll have a poll. So um, I'm not deciding the debate, you are deciding the debate. And no pressure on, on the speakers. Uh, you just have about a thousand people watching you to convince of your advocacy abilities uh, and your side. And the motion for today is, this house believes that virtual hearings are just as effective as in-person hearings. Um, like I said, I'm completely impartial. Uh, any um, you know, uh, screen that I have behind me is completely innocuous. Uh, I do not take any particular side at all. Uh, like I said, the audience is going to be deciding the outcome of the debate. Um, few additional rules, no name calling or hackling. Uh, please mute your mics when other people are speaking. And in case you're thinking of doing it, please do not purposely disrupt your video or audio feeds just to show how bad virtual hearings can be. So with those ground rules, could I invite the first speaker for the proposition, Ms. Joy Tan, to take the floor. Thank you, Edmund, and, and what a great uh, rehearsal of a video hearing protocol that you just set up. Uh, uh, th thank you to the SIAC for having me on this distinguished debating team, uh, and to all of you who have joined us today. My very eminent, as well as gallant co-debaters all agreed it would be ladies first. And as such, it is my privilege to lead off as first speaker for the proposition on this motion. This house believes that virtual hearings are just as effective as in-person hearings. And when I refer to virtual hearings, uh, I do so per the definition in the brand new SIAC guide to remote hearings, which was issued two days ago. Uh, that is conducting arbitral proceedings via audio or video conference or other non-physical means of communication. Um, I, I, in, in my view, this, this debate topic is a finely nuanced one because the reality is this. Thanks to COVID-19, because physical hearings have become so much more difficult, uh, virtual hearings have become inevitable. The question for us is whether the virtual hearing can be as effective as the physical ones they replace. National courts have taken up this challenge. Virtual hearings have become widespread in, in, in the UK's commercial courts in Australia, and none more so than here in Singapore, as outlined by our Chief Justice in his circuit breaker speech in May and in the panel session this morning. Uh, he said, virtual hearings represent an important means by which the courts can sustain access to justice during the pandemic and hopefully enhance this into the future. Where the courts have embraced innovation, how can the arbitral community not do likewise? And indeed, arbitral institutions have embraced it in space. The new SIAC guide 
uh, is the latest amongst the resources issued by arbitral institutions in support of the virtual hearing. So the arbitrations can continue virtually in a way that is as effective as before. My learned senior, Mr. Gary Bond, has already gone on record to explain that virtual hearings are legally permissible under most national laws. And I'm sure all of us are looking forward to hearing him discuss uh, how, um, as a second speaker for the proposition, how virtual hearings can be made even more effective uh, by using protocols as recommended in the new SIAC guide. Um, but, but let me first lead off by discussing uh, the benefits of the virtual hearing and the ways in which they can, in fact, be even more effective than a physical hearing. Uh, and in fact, challenges us to rethink the old ways of doing arbitration. This morning's keynote address by our Chief Justice focused on the issue of the increasingly long and costly nature of the international arbitration process. And that is especially stuck uh, when compared to speedy and inexpensive court systems like we have in Singapore. Um, the, feeling, the strong feeling from the proposition is that virtual hearing may change all that, resulting in shorter, more efficient, and less expensive arbitrations. I think the biggest benefit uh, of the virtual hearing is really how it can avoid delay. If the choice is between a virtual hearing that takes place on schedule uh, versus an in-person hearing, that has to be delayed until you know, travel restrictions are lifted, you'd imagine the choice is clear. Uh, and we could argue that delaying a, the case until a physical hearing can be held may in fact go against a tribunal's duty to conduct proceedings efficiently and in a timely way. Delay or lack of speed, as our Chief Justice mentioned in his address, uh, was identified by 34% of respondents in the 2018 edition of the White and Case Survey as, as being the worst characteristic of international arbitration. But across the world, uh, during the pandemic, arbitral hearings uh, managed to proceed without delay by being held virtually. Uh, the GAR recently featured a uh, very successful expedited arbitration uh, from the SIAC uh, involving, I think it was 19 participants foreign interpreters and, and three different time zones. And, and, and this managed to proceed virtually on the Maxwell Chambers ADR platform uh, using the CIR guidance protocol and, and it finished successfully within the stipulated six months. Where insisting on a physical hearing might cause delays, virtual hearings would allow the original hearing dates to remain and, and, and the award to be rendered as scheduled. And I, you, you, know, you don't get more effective than that. Virtual hearings will also save time and costs. As the chief pointed out, 67% of respondents to the same survey cited costs as being the worst characteristic of international arbitration. And it's true when you have international participants, physical hearings can be extremely expensive. Although of course, Singapore hotel rates and Maxwell venue rates are very reasonable. Um, but the virtual hearing will eradicate these costs entirely. There would also be substantial savings in travel time, both internationally as well as to and from the physical hearing venue, uh, which leads to my third point. The virtual hearing allows for greater scheduling flexibility. We have so many busy arbitrators and counsel uh, whose diaries are restricted uh, and you know, we, can't, we just can't get dates for, right? If you want them to fly out to Singapore to do a four week case, you're going to have to book them for months, if not years in advance. With the virtual hearing, this may change. For instance, if Mr. Bang, you know, was prepared to work even harder than he's working now, having virtual hearings would allow him to do a case in Seoul in the daytime, as well as be fixed for cases and meetings in London and New York, uh, you know, at night for him, all without having to leave the comfort of his home office or needing to put on his formal shoes. Um, also, virtual hearings will allow for greater participation and access to justice, leveling the playing field, for instance, for people who wouldn't ordinarily be able to travel uh, because of visa issues or scheduling conflicts. Um, also, those of us who are older and, and in the COVID at risk group uh, may now not be prepared to travel, you know, so far or who would, would, be, would be reluctant to agree to physical hearings, but they may well accept virtual ones. Admittedly, 
uh, when you've got participants spread across the world, uh, scheduling different time zones for a virtual hearing might be a challenge. But it may be better to stay up late or to get up early, as Mr. Bond did uh, when he was joining his panel today at 3 a.m., uh, than, than you know, to have to fly around and deal with jet lag. Um, th this will also probably mean shorter blocks of hearing, but uh, we see that as a good thing because that forces parties to be more efficient with their time, as this is one of the key issues cited previously in, in, in terms of controlling costs. Uh, you just need to make sure when you schedule uh, the time for your hearing uh, that any inconvenience in time zones is spread equally. Many platforms and arbitral institutions like Maxwell have, you know, uh, after hours support services, so you wouldn't be compromised as well technically if your hearing happens to be at night. Uh, fourthly, virtual hearings would encourage the greater use of electronic documents and hearing bundles. Uh, we're already using e-bundles, but the virtual hearing will help us take it to the next level because you, know, you don't have to courier documents to anyone's home. Uh, the e-bundles can be accessed remotely and don't have to be transported from place to place. Um, they are so much easier than paper documents to navigate and word search and show screen during a, a hearing. Um, many service providers like Epic and, and Opus who uh, have dedicated tech assistants who can help deploy the documents and hearings, and as a result, participants uh, then can see the documents faster as compared to traditional hearings. Lastly, uh, the virtual hearing uh, is much more environmentally friendly. Uh, there um, is a, the, the global concern about climate change. Uh, similarly, there's, there's also movement within the arbitration community to reduce the environmental impact caused by arbitration. I mean, we kill an inordinate number of trees with our people bundles. Uh, we leave a terrible carbon footprint thanks to international travel. Uh, holding virtual hearings will minimize the impact of each dispute in the environment. With Singapore's push for greener initiatives, maybe the SIAC will in future report uh, on what proportion of the arbitrations are green as part of the ESG scorecard uh, and take steps to encourage the virtual hearing as an environmentally friendly measure. So given these benefits, why is there still the concern with the virtual hearing? The main reason that's given is that the technology still isn't good enough to replicate a physical hearing. The proposition says this doesn't stand up to scrutiny. As long as you have proper preparation and protocols in place, uh, current technology makes a virtual hearing as effective as physical ones. It's true, there is some misplaced fear of the technology. Um, however, um, this is already familiar uh, and it's already acceptable that submissions in emergency arbitrations are conducted virtually. Uh, key witnesses give evidence via video link. The question becomes, why should users not accept the whole hearing being run this way? And the answer is, users have become more accepting. In the same 2018 study, where 64% of respondents said that they never used purely virtual hearings, 66% said that they ought to be used more often. And in 2020, we've seen this become a reality. I mentioned just a few new technological platforms available to support the virtual hearing. Uh, I'm told we're currently hosting more than 1,000 participants from across the world on Zoom with superb connectivity. There's also Skype, WebEx, BlueJeans, which, which Maxwell users, and other bespoke customized platform, uh, such as the one used by the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce and London IDRC. Together with these platforms, most hearing centers will offer virtual hearing rooms with integrated document management and meet procedural requirements of security and confidentiality, and can match the functionality of physical hearings. There might be a bit of slowness and lag, especially if you need foreign language translation, but this is not unsurmountable. And the high definition screens that we have now uh, give parties an even better close up at people's faces so that we can observe non-verbal cues uh, even better than in a physical hearing. Plus, if parties agree to video playback, you can revisit the evidence much more vividly than from the transcript. So much so that Maxwell and other hearing centers have glowing testimonials from across the arbitration industry. I've already mentioned the successful 19 participant hearing at Maxwell. Um, users have said that they have become fans of the virtual hearing. They've said, virtual hearings are so close to physical hearings, it did not feel like a second best option, but rather a state-of-the-art facility. 
Let me end by mentioning the protocols and guidelines available from the various arbitral institutions on how to prepare for and conduct a virtual arbitration hearing. Per the SIAC guide, a robust procedural uh, order for virtual hearings will help ensure that technical issues don't pose a due process risk. Mr. Bond will no doubt give the definitive word on how SIAC protocols can be deployed to preserve the essential elements of a fair hearing. Let me end by circling back to innovation. We should not be constrained by the traditional, slow, low technology, high cost physical hearings of yesterday. Our Chief Justice said the key benefit of arbitration is its agility and willingness to adapt. The new normal is here to stay. We should seize the opportunity posed by COVID and look forward to the virtual hearing as a state of the art for the future of our profession. The challenge is to undertake this innovation in a way that makes for an effective and even more efficient arbitral process. Uh, with that, I conclude my remarks and I hand my time over to the first speaker for the opposition, Mr. John Bank. Hang on, Joy. I want to thank you for being extremely efficient and keeping to the time. Remind me never to take you on in a 15 minute challenge because you managed to get so much in there. I'm not sure what Gary's going to say. Um, and the Statisticians Society of Singapore thanks you, and John thanks you as well uh, for suggesting he should get more bang for his buck. With that, now may I invite the first speaker for the opposition, Mr. John Bang, to address us. Thank you, Edmund. Um, very good morning, evening, or night to the audience, depending on where you're tuning in from. I am sure that a lot of you from different parts of the world are up at odd hours and have been listening to us. For that, let me extend my, my gratitude. I will ensure that I take your concerns in my case against the motion. It's a privilege to go uh, up against Joey and Gary. I know them both well and have a lot of respect for them. I must admit that I spent a lot of time thinking about what my case should be. And I will take the next 15 minutes to convince everyone that for once it is entirely reasonable to ignore everything Joy and Gary say on, on behalf of the motion and find that, in fact, this House does not believe that virtual hearings is, are just as effective as in-person hearings. Before I go on to introduce my case and tell you why this motion should, must be defeated, I must first tell you what I am not going to be saying today. The motion does not require me to argue that virtual hearings are bad or that they can never be as good as in-person hearings in the future. I have a far simpler task. My job today, members of this house, is merely to convince all of you that virtual hearings are less effective than in-person hearings. Not that they cannot be in the future, but just that they are not today. I fully agree with proponents uh, for the motion that in many ways, virtual hearings are the future and can possibly one day be just as effective as in-person hearings. Unfortunately for, for Gary and Joy, and fortunately for Rob and I, and that day is not today. Members of this House, I, I will argue that there are questions about accessibility of the technology needed to conduct virtual hearings, and there are some there are serious issues concerning enforcement of procedural rules, particularly during cross examinations, and the inescapable reality that all of us live in countries with different time zones that make virtual hearings far less efficient than those conducted in person. I understand that the world we live in today is beset by travel and public health restrictions that often make in-person hearings, as we understand them, infeasible, creating a gap in international arbitration. Some hearings cannot wait and have been moved online because of the lack of options. I would, of course, much rather be in Singapore right now, standing before all of you, making this argument and looking in the eyes of the audience. But in a situation where we can we could not conduct hearings in person uh, the way we used to, the, the way we wished to. We, we shifted to virtual hearings. This shift is a result of circumstances beyond our control. I am worried that those currently speaking in, in support of the motion are forgetting that the choice for virtual hearings existed prior to the pandemic too. Parties and arbitrators, for well-considered reasons, chose not to make that choice. Most of the benefits of virtual hearings that those who savor virtual hearings talk about existed prior to the pandemic. Yet, most customers in the market 
continue to pick in-person hearings. The pandemic makes in-person hearings impossible right now, which definitely makes virtual or remote hearings a powerful substitute. But it does not make virtual hearings into what they were never meant to be, a complete substitute for in-person hearings. To offer you an analogy, consider a person who uses a sports utility vehicle to go from point A to B because he or she wants the fastest way to get to point B. They pick the SUV above all other alternatives, but their car breaks down one day and they can't wait to get it repaired, so they reluctantly get on the bus because they have no other choice. The lack of an alternative does not indicate that they are the best or the most effective option, but merely, as of now, there is no other option. Like the bus, the virtual hearings previously existed, yet people chose to use their cars in the same way people chose in person hearings over virtual hearings consistently. If over time one sees marked improvements in the public transport system, such as, you know, getting public transport to work for a change, which Gary as a Londoner probably often dreams about. Well, sorry, Gary probably doesn't use public transport because there's no deck in the tube for him to work on the next edition of this treatise. Not sure how this joke played out because I can't see or hear the audience in this virtual debate. Maybe some point in the future, you make the switch, but to argue that virtual hearings are just as efficient as in-person in, in hear, hearing today is to be ignorant of, of reality because they cannot possibly be as efficient if most of us have not been convinced by them when we had the option. We do not always have the option now because the pandemic sometimes make it mandatory for us to utilize virtual hearing tools. We must adapt when we must, but I believe that we are underselling the size of the switch to the arbitration community when we suggest that the change to virtual hearings is not extraordinary. It truly is. But what are these problems? Uh, there, are, there are questions of access. With regard to questions of access and efficiency, there are two specific arguments that I want to make. Firstly, the, the, that the kind of technology and capacity needed to conduct virtual hearings successfully is not universally available. Secondly, that people often connect, connecting from different time zones pose a great challenge to the claim that virtual hearings can be just as efficient as in-person hearings. With regards to te technology, in the, many, in the many hearings that I've participated in, even when one, uh, one witness has testified remotely, I don't remember any of them happening without some issue or, or a problem. Virtual hearings can be conducted in multiple ways. You could have situations where parties and arbitrators gather in dedicated virtual facilities, hearing facilities in different cities like Maxwell Chambers or the Seoul IDRC, where the risk of technical difficulties would be the lowest. However, how many cities across the world have these high-tech facilities? Maxwell Chambers is fantastic. But parties from across the world flew to Maxwell Chambers because in many instances, they did not have similar facilities in their cities. What has happened in the last six months wherein the infrastructure has developed to such an extent that most parties could have access to such institutional support without travel. The parties could conduct hearings on Zoom or platforms, but these are, not, these are even more susceptible to technical failures. However, irrespective of the kind of technology being used, can we ensure that everyone has access the whole time? Because if one person does not have access to high-speed internet and keeps disconnected, the efficiency of the hearing clearly suffers. And just to brag, this applies to all of you not living within the physical, physical vicinity of BTS, Blackpink, or Psy in Korea that has the fastest internet in the world. And among the three K-pop stars, I need not to mention the obvious parallels between me and BTS, or maybe closer to Psy uh, because of my weight. These problems simply do not exist for in-person hearings. There is no lag. There are no questions of, of whether or not someone can hear the other. There are, few, there are far fewer situations where a party can argue that it's been treated unfairly when everyone is sitting in one room. At the same time, I think there's, there's a very important discussion regarding the issue of time zones. The defining feature of international arbitration was that it's brought together parties from different parts of the world, gave them the opportunity to resolve disputes in a fair manner. In virtual hearings, 
the departees are from two different countries, say Korea and the United States. While the tribunal is composed of arbitrators from Singapore, United Kingdom, and Argentina, we have a situation where everyone is in a different time zone. How do you time the hearing? Someone, either a party, a witness, an arbitrator, will end up and I'll get to participate in the hearing that goes on for eight hours at 3 a.m. their time, which will, be, which will inevitably lead, lead to an inefficiency. Attention spans are anyway shorter than dealing with video when compared to face-to-face -face interactions, and they only go down as the night grows longer. We are talking about, say, conducting a complex evidentiary hearing that lasts between 10 to 15 days with some 20 witnesses where the proceedings last for eight hours every night. I don't think anyone can say with a straight face, not even Gary, that a hearing where arbitrator or a counsel has to sit for eight hours every night, possibly starting at 3 a.m., looking at a screen all night for two weeks going into to leave, uh, to sit for eight hours every night, possibly starting at 3 a.m., looking at a screen all night for two weeks uh, is going to lead to the same amount of efficiency as if when they were sitting in the same room from 9 to 5 p.m. There is where, this is where I must also contend the example uh, used by Joy of courts in different jurisdictions shifting to virtual hearings. It's not a fair one. Most countries have litigants and their counsel present in the same time zone and just generally don't face many of the challenges that, funda that are fundamental to proceedings that are truly international. Again, in exceptional circumstances, this is perhaps justifiable. However, for virtual hearings to be just as effective and efficient in, as in-person hearings, Joy and Gary need to demonstrate to the House that there are similar problems with in-person hearings or that, it's not, that there, this is not a drawback at all. Because again, the standard proposed by the motion is equal effectiveness, not sort of works or it's close. Second, there are important questions of enforcing procedural rules. This is commonly identified problem, which my colleagues will try to trivialize, appealing to all of your commit, commitment toward professionalism and upholding ethical rules. But I say this issue must be given its proper consideration, as it is a very important one, one that touches not only on efficiency, but one more importantly on due process and fair play. Here I want to focus on conducting cross-examination virtually. There are two important questions we must consider. First, how do we ensure proper conduct by both counsel and witnesses? And second, how do we conduct proper forensic cross-examination that we're used to? At the outset, I must first state that virtual hearings make traditional cross-examination more or less infeasible. I'm talking about important, probative, and intense cross-examinations where you need to obtain various submissions and or impeach the witness's credibility. These kind of cross-examinations are often long, and require getting the witness to focus on a series of documents just for one line of questioning. How do you maintain any level of intensity when the witness can claim connection issues or claim that the document is not clearly legible on his screen? How can counsel or the tribunal determine if the witness is being honest or not without being able to see firsthand the witness's facial expressions or demeanor or just listen to their voice in person? How do we stop its weaponization? Imagine if you're in the middle of a contentious point and want, to, want them to focus on a particular page. It's a page that perhaps gets the witness in trouble and you, have a lot, and you spend a lot of time leading up to this. What does one do if the witness claims he just can't hear you for a bit? Or actually to repeat the question twice when the, when the witness clearly heard the answer and he's just trying to buy time to, to think of the answer. Or even worse, turn off the video link like this and say it was accidental. And Edmund, uh, you told me that protocol after I thought of this, so sorry about that. This dilemma takes us to a larger question. How do we enforce procedural and ethical rules that we have come to take for granted with in-person hearings? I mean, of course, we already have protocols in place, but how does one check if they're being followed? We would all like to live in a world where the existence of legal standards is followed by good observance of the law. But let's be honest, we're all too aware that that does not happen all the time. We are forced to, as the famous jurist Oliver Wendell Holmes asked us to do, look at how the bad man would look at the law. And in these uh, 
it's cases it's difficult, if not impossible, to enforce ethical standards. So we send lawyers to people. So do we send lawyers to people people's houses when they give testimony from home? The current travel restrictions that make in-person hearings impossible would would make such travel by lawyers to people's houses impossible. How do we check if someone has a screen in front of them when they're giving testimony? It is a difficult task. It is not even obvious to everyone watching me give the speech, but I have two huge screens in front of me that I could have used as notes or... There you go. <clears throat> we all have to admit that, with, that a witness cannot behave this way at an in-person hearing. And unfortunately, however, we cannot say the same thing at a virtual hearing. Therefore, for virtual hearings to be just as effective as in-person hearings, I should be able to guarantee to my client that I can prevent witness tutoring or cheating, just as, just, uh, just as I would be able to in an in-person hearing. Can I do that? I don't think any reasonable person can confidently say 100% yes. As long as this problem exists, it is impossible for virtual hearings to be just as efficient as those held in person. In conclusion, I appreciate when my colleagues uh, say that there are solvable problems that we will soon, perhaps a year, perhaps sooner, build both the technological and, uh, and practical uh, capabilities required to deal with some of these problems. However, as of today, at least three specific problems ensure that it is clearly wrong and unreasonable to suggest that the virtual hearings are just as effective as in-person hearings. We continue to have no solution to the fact that people are situated in different time zones and someone or uh, the other will suffer prejudice. I don't, I don't think we have managed to figure out how to ensure ethical conduct by witnesses and even generally ensuring that we can conduct cross-examination. So again, to, to join Gary, I say not today. And Gary, you can relax now. There's no need to take the tube. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. You've raised an interesting question. Um, let's see how someone who wakes up at 3 a.m. in the morning to listen to a keynote, uh, plenar uh, participate in a plenary, uh, be on screen for quite a while, performs um, in an ad advocacy setting. So I hope that question is going to be answered by someone who is completely unknown in international arbitration, Mr. Gary Bourne. Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Edmund. And thank you for the, the plugs for my, my treatise, John. Um, it, I can well understand why John would prefer that the audience ignore what Joy has said and what I'm going to, to say. Only if you do ignore that can you conclude that the motion should not pass. When we think about remote hearings or, or virtual hearings, I think we inevitably react the way people do to any new technology. We react with uncertainty. How does it work? We react in some cases with, with fear, the way I think we heard from, from John. And when you listen to, to the opponents of the motion, what they really ask you to do is to believe their uncertainties, their fears, their prejudices about a new technology. We don't have to listen to them because we have a host of evidence, a host of data that actually tell us how virtual hearings, how remote hearings, are conducted in practice and how they're perceived by the users, not by advocates who are paid to take a particular position in this debate, but instead by the users, the arbitrators, the judges, the parties. And I'd like in the time that's available to me to go through that empirical evidence which you haven't heard from and which the opponents of the motion would like you to ignore. Let's start with what arbitral institutions around the world do. They, after all, know more, in a sense, institutionally, based on their institutional knowledge about arbitration than almost anybody else. It's remarkable that every single arbitral institution in the world, of course, SIC, but also the ICC, our principal competitor, ICSID, the PCA, 
all of them have conducted virtual hearings on the basis that not just they're as effective today as Mr. Bang would have us focus, but more effective than in-person hearings. Every single one of those institutions continues to conduct all of the cases in its caseload by virtual hearings. There are, of course, some exceptions, just as there are exceptions in in in-person hearings for delays and particular circumstances, but all of those institutions, as well as regional institutions, whether it's the Vienna International Arbitration Center, the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, the LCIA, or other regional institutions, the vote of institutions around the world has been uniformly and overwhelmingly in favor of virtual hearings. The same is true of national courts. National courts in every single major jurisdiction, starting with Singapore, but continuing with the United Kingdom where some 3,000 hearings are conducted virtually every day, to Canada where the Federal Court of Canada approved the use of virtual hearings specifically on the basis that they were as fair as in-person hearings to Australia and other common law jurisdictions around the world. The same is true in civil law jurisdictions. Netherlands passed legislation mandating the use of virtual hearings. Switzerland has done the same. Other civil law jurisdictions to, to the same effect. And for, for users of SIIC, India has also been an active user of, of virtual hearings. It's not just national courts, though. Um, when we think about the fears that are are conjured up about virtual hearings, think about the VIS moot. The 248 teams from all around the world conducted on six weeks notice the, with 4,000 participants, the VIS moot, uh, with an extraordinarily positive reaction from all of the users. None of those teams felt that they didn't have an effective opportunity to present their cases. There have been user surveys people who've gone out actually and, and studied the reactions of users, lawyers, parties, and others to virtual hearings. Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Services did a study in July of this year. Their conclusion was, and I'll quote it because I think it's quite, quite telling, most users commented on the convenience of having a video hearing and the time and cost it saved them. In fact, users far from finding virtual hearings inaccessible commented that they were more accessible than in-person hearings, even in-person hearings as they historically existed. The Civil Justice Council of England and Wales surveyed more than a thousand respondents. 72% were positive in concluding that virtual hearings were more effective than in-person hearings and had no complaints. Interestingly, those rates rose among those who had more rather than less experience with virtual hearings. Judges and arbitrators have reached precisely the same conclusions. Let me quote from the English judge, Justice Tier, who ran the first English commercial court hearing. He said, the hearing was conducted without any technical hitch and all parties cooperated to ensure that the hearing took place efficiently and fairly. Precisely the same conclusions were reached by Canadian judges who held virtual hearings. And in many of these cases, counsel, in fact, are in multiple different locations. Um, we'll come on and talk in rebuttal about the issue of time zones, um, but, but certainly being in remote locations presented no difficulty whatsoever for virtual hearings. Lord Reed commented in the UK Supreme Court that the reaction to video hearings has been very positive. And all of this empirical, empirical evidence, actual use, not the fears of counsel, I think is extraordinarily compelling in addressing the issue before us. It's also interesting that in a significant number of cases, both in SIEC, but also otherwise, Parties voluntarily agree, mutually agree, both parties agree to a virtual hearing. That's because both parties recognize that a virtual hearing is just as effective and indeed in present circumstances substantially more effective than an in-person hearing. There have been a number of guides and Joy prefaced um, these, these comments. There have been a number of guides, including 
um, one of the forerunners by KCAB. I think Bacon and Lee actually was a substantial contributor to that guide, which was a, a path uh, a pathfinder in terms of setting out how virtual hearings can be more effective than in-person hearings. The savings of time and cost are obvious, as Joy has pointed out. But ICSID, the SIAC, Maxwell Chambers themselves, um, the AAA, ICDR have also published guides which walk one through the technicalities, the nuts and bolts of how you effectively conduct a virtual hearing, just as we're effectively conducting this virtual Congress with, I would say, a larger attendance than any prior SIC Congress. That's, in my view, something that's more effective, not less effective. I'd like to focus specifically now, though, on the, the question of timing. The, the opponents of this motion have said, what we need to do is not look at the future, how virtual hearings might be in six months or 12 months time, but look at virtual hearings now as compared to in-person hearings now. And I, think when, and I think that's the right focus. And I think when you focus on that, you realize in a moment that this motion must pass. The reason that you realize that is because in-person hearings, in Mr. Bang's words, are impossible today. You can't have in-person hearings because of travel restrictions. And therefore, when you compare a virtual hearing, which like this virtual Congress, you can have, to an in-person hearing, which like an in-person Congress, as Mr. Bang rightly pointed out, you can't have, which one's more effective? Is it more effective to have a hearing or to not have a hearing. It's obvious that today, virtual hearings are, in a very real sense, the only show in town. And therefore, they are by definition more effective than the alternatives. Steve Jobs said of technology that innovation decides who are leaders and who are followers. The opponents of this motion would have us be followers. They would have us not use the technology that's available to us. And that is in fact being used for this very Congress. They would have us not do what national courts around the world are effectively doing. That has things exactly backwards. Arbitration has always and rightly been a leader. We're still being a leader today, both with this Congress and otherwise. There's no reason for us to go back to the dark ages the medieval ages, we should instead embrace the technology that we now have. I think with that, you can ignore the remaining five minutes that I have because the motion has effectively passed. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you, Gary. And now it falls on Mr. Rob Palmer to tell us whether that persuaded him, whether he's a born again virtual hearing supporter or not. Over to you, Rob. Edmund, thank you. And uh, let me start not by uh, confessing my uh, born again status, but by thanking all of our virtual audience for making the, uh, the effort to join us in these interesting times. And interesting, as has been made amply clear to all of us during today's uh, session, is no understatement. We might say that the COVID-19 party has been in full swing for some time now. And if you'll excuse me for stretching the, uh, the metaphor somewhat, the drinks are running low. We're completely out of the champagne that is the in-person hearing. But Gary and Joy are not deterred. Oh no, they've found a supply of extra strong virtual hearing lager. It's fairly sickly stuff. And to be honest, some of the more responsible party goers are already saying no more. But Gary and Joy are a few bottles in now and it's tasting not too bad. In fact, it's tasting great. They're raving about it. But let's be clear about this. The hangover is coming. In the morning, Gary will be calling the, po the host to apologize for throwing up in the corner. Joy will be apologizing for stealing the glassware. And take it from me, both of them will be reminding themselves never again to overdo the virtual hearings. Now, of course, you've heard a fair amount today about the efficiencies that come with virtual hearings. 
But before I get to the substance of my remarks, let's first come back to the proposition before us. This House believes that virtual hearings are just as effective as in-person hearings. Effective, of course, is not the same as efficient. We, the opposition, don't contest that certain features of virtual hearings that Gary and Joy have mentioned, digitalized case books, for example, have made our hearings more efficient, practically speaking. We don't deny that the elimination of associated travel is efficient in reducing uh, associated carbon footprints. But effectiveness is something else entirely. And in preparing for this, this session, and despite appearances, there was a degree of uh, preparation involved, I consulted the, uh, the Cambridge English Dictionary, which told me that effective means, and I quote, successful in achieving the result that one wants. What does that mean in the context of an arbitration hearing? Well, John's already touched on a number of the practical connotations, such as the ability to cross-examine appropriately. But effectiveness in an arbitration hearing should, in my submission, also encompass the essential elements of fairness, including the right to be heard, the right to due process, equality, and confidentiality particularly in a commercial arbitration context, of course. Now, I'll take it for granted that fairness, and therefore effectiveness, in an arbitration hearing requires ethical behaviour from the parties and from their counsel. And it's my submission today that virtual hearings facilitate unethical behaviour. If I can make good on that submission, and I will do that, it's fatal to the proposition that virtual hearings are just as effective as in-person hearings. Now, of course, I, I do acknowledge that even before COVID-19 and the widespread adoption of virtual hearings, the state of attorney ethics in international arbitration had already been described by people like Catherine Rogers as, I'm quoting here, an ethical no man's land or an ethical abyss in which no one seemed to know what, uh, if any, ethical rules applied to the conduct of lawyers. But virtual hearings throw us even deeper into this ethical of this, and that's the crux of my argument today. Now, I, I trust it's not contentious to, to take the, the position that the environment in which dispute resolution takes place has a fundamental influence on process. And many of you would have heard of the term or at the very least the concept of the online disinhibition effect. Now that's a term co uh, coined by John Sula, a professor of psychology back in 2004. And it describes the lowering of psychological restraints when someone communicates online in comparison to communicating in person. The removal of the in-person physical element of interactions lowers psychological restraints on unethical behavior and it creates and it promotes environments which are conducive to that less ethical behavior. Really, I hear you say, at least I would if I were not stuck in my virtual echo chamber here. To, to see this in effect, uh, we need only look at the cesspit. And I, and I don't think that's an overstatement. The cesspit that is social media today, the proliferation of cyberbullying, conspiracy theories and hate speech provide a frightening demonstration of the online disinhibition effect in action. And to be clear, this is a function of virtualization, of digitalization, and not anonymity. Research has shown that users tend to monitor their behavior less frequently and less saliently when they're online as compared to when they're offline. The lack of subtle social cues like uh, direct eye contact decreases self-awareness. And what's most interesting about this research is that participants are less inhibited just by mere removal of direct eye contact, even when everything else, name, site, or contextual identifying information included in, uh, including seeing them, uh, stays the same. And that this disinhibition effect is also amplified by informality, which is an almost inevitable feature of online interaction. Now, when we were uh, discussing the session, uh, John made it very clear to me that I was expected to wear a uh, presentable shirt so as not to embarrass him. At his insistence, I've done exactly that. 
Nothing was said, however, about choice of trousers. My point is this. I'm willing to turn up in front of a thousand people wearing pink flamingo board shorts today because I'm hiding behind a screen. So in the usual course, there's no repercussions for me. The comfort of the screen and the lack of any in-person element creates an informal environment. But my proposition today is more than that. Drawing on the online disinhibition effect, I say that virtual hearings take place in an environment which not only lowers ethical thresholds, but it provides ample opportunity for bad behavior. And we can see those opportunities when considering three key aspects of the hearing process. Firstly, facilitating witness evidence. Secondly, preserving confidentiality and commercial arbitration. And thirdly, ensuring impartial decision making. Now, John's already highlighted a number of issues surrounding our inability to prevent witnesses from being able to covertly deal with counsel when a hearing is ongoing or during a break. And many online hearing protocols try to mitigate these situations. We have the SOL protocol, for example, which uh, requires, to, to, to quote from that document, a reasonable part of the interior of the room in which the witness is located to be shown on the screen. We have the CIR guidance note on remote dispute resolution proceedings, which requires sufficient visibility. And then the ICC guidance note, which um, suggests a 360 degree view for all participating rooms might be required. And Gary and Joy have, have placed some emphasis on these types of measures, but none of those protocols address the possibility where a witness places a phone directly in front of their screen under the webcam, for example where a witness reads pre-prepared answers on a piece of paper out of the camera's sight, or a witness chats separately with counsel on encrypted messaging apps like Telegram or WhatsApp, perhaps during breaks. And John's already touched on the, the possibility that a witness, when she's lost her way, can quite easily feign connection difficulties, such that the tribunal will deem the video conference, I'm quoting here from the Seoul Protocol, so unsatisfactory that it is unfair to either party to continue. And if we turn then to the issue of confidentiality, of course, many local arbitration laws and institutional rules provide for this, but how do we ensure that confidentiality is preserved in light of reliance on technology? And to be clear, this is not just fear mongering. We're not being Luddites here. How can we be sure that an interesting par interested party is not recording without authorization and releasing such uh, recordings to others like the press? But despite reassurances from software providers that they patch their software and maintain the highest standards of security, numerous incidents of Zoom bombing, external parties hijacking VC conferences continue to occur. And this is going to be a particular concern, of course, in arbitrations that involve state actors or with geopolitical implications. And what then about my third area, the, the decision makers themselves? The legitimacy of the arbitration ecosystem depends upon decision makers, not just being impartial, but being seen to be impartial. Users of arbitration often opt for a three-member tribunal because they expect a collegial decision based upon the interaction of three people, and they expect that that's going to enhance fairness and impartiality in the decision-making process. If tribunal members are interacting only virtually, however, we have the prospect of partisan appointees, freed from the constraints that come with in-person interaction with other tribunal members, acting as advocates for their appointing party. A remote risk, you say? Possibly. But the very possibility of such behavior is a significant factor weighing against the effectiveness of virtual hearings. Now, clearly the trend towards digitalization of arbitration predates COVID and no one, or at least not the opposition today, is suggesting that we act like Luddites and reject this trend entirely. We should all recognize that there will be a new norm post-pandemic, 
and this may well involve elements of the arbitration process being carried out virtually or remotely. And as, as Gary said in the panel discussion earlier today, every arbitration is a snowflake, and sometimes a virtual hearing may be appropriate. But even the most ardent proponent of virtual hearings would be hard pressed to claim that these are just as effective as in-person ones. Even the well-known futurist, Professor Suskin, doesn't envisage a future of purely virtual hearings. Rather, he sees a blend of physical, virtual, online tribunals with disputes disaggregated into their component parts and each part allocated to the most appropriate type of tribunal. In short, the ethical concerns raised by virtual hearings and the opportunities they provide for bad behavior mean that they simply are not today and may never be as effective as in-person hearings. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Right, so now we're gonna have rebuttal speeches by both sides before we open up the uh, floor to questions uh, from the audience. And if I could invite, I'm not sure whether it's going to be Joy or it's going to be Gary. They've sort of hedged their bets on this one. Uh, but I see Gary's unmuted himself. So it's going to be Mr. Gary Bourne to reply for the proposition. Thank you very much, Edmund. If, if we're permitted, um, Ms. Tan and I agreed that I would start and she would um, clean up after me. Um, there would no doubt be a, a trail behind me. Um, so very quickly. The, there was no answer at all to the fundamental point that something is better than nothing. Something is more effective than nothing. And if, as, as Mr. Bang rightly pointed out, the resolution requires us to look at what is more effective today, then virtual hearings, which are possible today, are by definition more effective than in-person hearings, which are not possible. And that's really an end of the, the debate. I would, though, just for the, the sake of debate, like to touch on a few of the practical issues, the very limited number of practical issues that the opposition raised about virtual hearings. Let's start first with, with cross-examination. There's the suggestion that one can't send lawyers to watch a witness who's being cross-examined. And as Mr. Palmer correctly conceded, in fact, cameras have been suggested by most arbitral institutions, either 360 degree cameras or multiple cameras in the room as ready solutions to that particular problem. One can make sure there's no one else in the room. One can make sure that there are not notes or phones in front of the witness. Arbitral tribunals are obviously alive to the possibility of improper witness coaching. And despite that, both arbitral institutions and arbitral tribunals have happily gone ahead with cross-examination and the overwhelming consensus among both tribunals and counsel is that they are able to detect improper witness coaching. Of course, the improper witness coaching is a possibility even in in-person hearings. I would suggest that through the use of recorded testimony, which is available in virtual hearings, one can in fact detect improper coaching more readily in a virtual than in an in-person context. There's also the suggestion that long cross-examination is difficult and that it's difficult to display documents. One can't really see the witness's face, can't really see facial expressions. That's also not true. We can see one another's facial expressions here in this video, um, this virtual Congress, better than we could in a real Congress, better than we could in, an, in a hearing. One is able to focus both on the witness's face and facial expressions and on their body language. Tribunals, again, as well as counsel with experience in virtual hearings, agree upon that. One doesn't lose anything in terms of being able to assess a witness's cre credibility. Mr. Palmer suggests that virtual hearings are an extension of uh, no man's land or no woman's land for council ethics and the behavior of participants in, in international arbitration. And he looks to social media as, as evidence of undisciplined behavior and a loss of trust. 
that in fact is far-fetched in the extreme. Social media is a vast and uncontrolled forum in comparison to international arbitration where a tribunal maintains tight control over the virtual hearing and is able to regulate exactly how it is that the parties and counsel behave. Counsel remain bound by precisely the same ethical rules plus new rules about the conduct of virtual hearings. And thus, there's no greater risk, and that's why both national courts and arbitration institutions have gone forward with virtual hearings for the last six or seven months. The ethical concerns that, that Mr. Palmer raises apply just as fully in national court proceedings, and that hasn't stopped virtually every national court in the world from proceeding with them. Finally, time zones. Obviously, because of Zoom fatigue, one needs to, to rethink the way hearings are conducted, but that doesn't mean that you can't have hearings, including with parties from disparate time zones at the beginning of end of days. If someone has to get up at three in the morning, or in my case right now, six or seven in the morning, one is perfectly able to do that. There are windows of opportunity, even in the most far-flung arbitrations. In addition, people are able to travel to hubs where they can conduct um, arbitrations um, in, in more contiguous time zones. Joy, I'm sure you've got more to add to that, but that um, I think disposes of the motion that is, is um, presented to us. No, uh, fully, Gary, uh, you, you've, I think, fully addressed all the, the, the points. Um, I was just going to pick up the, the last point that you made uh, regarding the, the, the hubs, um, and, and, and this goes to Mr. Bang's uh, issue regarding, you know, the, the technological concerns uh, that were posed by the virtual hearing, not how everyone doesn't have the same access to technology in their homes. I, I feel that the, so thanks to COVID, you know, with, with, with more of us working from home, uh, your governments have all increased sort of the, the, the overall internet coverage, so that access isn't, that excuse isn't available anymore. And, um, you know, just speaking to, to, to some of Mr. Bang's concerns, KCAB has, has indeed recently advocated the use of these virtual hearing hubs where, you know, parties don't conduct arbitrations from their homes, but they, they, they travel to a different hearing center in an arbitration location closest to them. Uh, and, and sort of giving life to this concept, Maxwell has just announced a team up uh, with London's IDRC and Canada's arbitration place to, to launch this arbitration center alliance. Uh, where parties can attend at a partner facility that's closest to them, or remotely through the, the, the IACA virtual platform. So conducted this way, a virtual hearing across partner facilities can be conducted seamlessly. Uh, and and ho hopefully uh, they'll, they'll uh, forgive my plug uh, for Maxwell since uh, I, I realized that, that the protocol did uh, suggest that we had a five, that, that, that the time is, was, was up. Thank you. Thank you, Joy, and thank you, Gary. Um, right, I'm just going to be uh, fair to the other side out of procedural, well, the principle of procedural fairness. So, uh, Rob and John, if both of you want to speak, you are entitled to do that, although Rob's indicated he's speaking. And if I could just ask the SIAC uh, timekeepers to ensure that they get the same time as uh, Gary and Joy. So who'd like to go first on the opposition side? Thank you, Edmund. I, I will uh, I will lead off, and then uh, then John can chime in with any further points that I've I've overlooked, because um, I don't think actually we need long to dispose of the proposition's position here. They have been very accommodating in acknowledging that their entire argument rests on a strained interpretation of the motion. Essentially, they argue that virtual hearings are I'm quoting here the only game in town. We're told it's better to go ahead with a hearing than have nothing. And we're told that virtual hearings are not a bad thing if one is at an enhanced risk of contacting COVID-19. Now, in reality, our submission is that any reasonable user of arbitration, given the option, is likely to opt for an in-person hearing when available rather than a remote hearing and that in itself is dispositive of the motion. Now, beyond that, the proposition referred to various efficiencies, they say, in process that stem from virtual hearings. They spoke about cost savings, for example. But if we turn to those, hearings are not the source of the problem. 
The Chief Justice spoke earlier today about the increased complexity of the arbitral process, the thousands of pages of submissions and so on. That's a criticism of the arbitral system more generally, not the hearing process per se, and is something that is in no way addressed by virtual hearings. The hearing costs essentially are marginal in the greater scheme of things. We heard about uh, reduction of carbon footprint, and uh, while we can all agree that's a, a good thing, that has nothing to do with effectiveness. I mean, the reality is that despite concerns about CO2 emissions, we continue to flicker a switch when we need electric light to see. And in the same way, users of arbitral uh, proceedings will continue to require in-person hearings if they want to ensure a fair process. Now, we were promised a, uh, a quote here, a host of data about how virtual hearings are perceived and uh, about the fact they are shown to be more effective than in-person hearings. In reality, we had assertions, unsurprising, that institutions continue to conduct essentially all of their matters by virtual hearings. Not surprising in the situation of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we were told that national courts uh, continue to do likewise. Now that latter point requires a bit more examination. Gary quoted from uh, Justice Tier, and, and I think this was the high point of the discussion surrounding national courts, um, who made the comment that there was no hitch in a virtual hearing. So somewhat damned with, with faint praise there. Again, if we go back to the Chief Justice's comments uh, this morning, he alluded to the fact that in Singapore, outside of the Court of Appeal, virtual hearings are being used for directions hearings and matters not involving witness evidence, clearly implying, at least in my submission, that it is not an appropriate uh, procedure for matters requiring extensive cross-examination of witnesses. And I think it's telling to, um, to, to turn to a couple of quotes which represent views from other members of the judiciary. Um, and, and I'll close with these. The first is from uh, the US, Justice Scalia in, in Coy in Iowa, speaking about the um, confrontation principle. And he speaks about this uh, being required to compel accusers to make their accusations in the defendant's presence, which is in no way equivalent to making them in a room that contains a television set beaming electrons that portray the defendant's image. And that leaves no one in any doubt about his position as to, to virtual hearings. And if we turn to um, Australia, uh, Chief Justice Bathurst, in a report on virtualization of the court system, uh, distributed courts. He, he noted that um, using distributed court technologies may save money and improve access. It may also, however, represent a threat to long established legal traditions, privilege efficiency at the expense of due process and deprive litigants of their day in court. New technologies are frequently rolled out with very little evidence about their impacts on people or processes. That, in our submission, is what the proposition would have the arbitration world do here, and we say that is in no way as effective as in-person hearings. John, are there further points you would like to touch on? Thank you, Rob. Um, uh, just uh, very briefly, first, I just want to point out that I had no idea that Rob was going to wear pink shorts. That was not a team decision. Um, second, um, you know, uh, in, with respect to uh, Mr. Bourne's argument that something is better than thing, I think Rob made a, a very good point, but just want, want to add that, um, you know, uh, I think that that argument is an unfair and extreme reading of the motion. The motion does not say this House believes that the virtual hearings are just as effective as a substitute of in-person hearing. It says is as just effective as in-person hearings. As I said, that's equal effectiveness, not uh, because something uh, does not exist in the present. So uh, we believe, uh, Rob and I, that uh, uh, the House should um, uh, vote against the motion. Thank you, John. Right, we've got some questions coming in. 
And these questions I'm going to pose to actually both sides. If the timekeepers could limit each side to 90 seconds each to answer the questions, if they could. Um, the first, uh, and we'll start with the uh, proposition, then the opposition, so you decide on each side who would like to answer. Um, the first question is interesting. How can virtual hearings be as effective as in-person hearings if unequal access to use of technology and accessibility is an issue? And I'm just going to tag on to that. A lot of the statistics we, we uh, heard just now are from jurisdictions where arbitration is very uh, established, um, technology is advanced. Uh, what about places where the um, internet connection is not so good, like Pakistan, according to Mr. Landau this morning, um, or uh, the tech setup for the witnesses is not adequate because you're relying on him uh, to look at, let's say, his mobile phone, and then he sees everybody really small on the screen. Um, so who'd like to go first? Maybe I'll take a first crack at it and then Joy can um, um, conclude. Sounds um, like a wrestling just, match. Yep. Just, just very briefly, in, in most parts of the world, internet access works perfectly fine. I think that's why, in fact, one is seeing national courts in Latin America, in Africa, elsewhere, using virtual hearings. It's why ICSID is conducting virtual hearings, including with state respondents from, from parts of the world, which at first glance, one might think lacked appropriate internet access. I think Mr. Landau's um, participation this morning is an excellent illustration of how that is true, even with places like Pakistan. He appeared perfectly well and he reported prior to to um, the session that he expected, as on all other occasions when he'd been conducting virtual hearings, um, to be able to do so. And so I think the concern about access is fair enough. One has a concern about access to in-person hearings with visa requirements or concerns about extradition and the like. Um, in exceptional circumstances, obviously adjustments need to be made. Someone has to go to a neighboring country or whatnot. But in the vast majority of cases, Technology really does work, and we don't need to be afraid of goblins under the bed. Joy? Um, how, how can I do better than, than, than that? I mean, as, as uh, Gary says, um, Mr. Landau joined us perfectly well this morning. Uh, and uh, if you know you can get internet coverage in Pakistan, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you can get good internet coverage across the world. I mean, I think. Uh, that I, I suppose sort of taking off the, the proposition hat somewhat and, and, and putting on the, the general practitioner hat. I mean, it's, it's true that if really you have a location where you know, it's impossible to get internet, right? Uh, say you're in Antarctica. I think, I think you know, certainly those might be uh, threshold issues and, and the exceptional circumstance in which possibly a virtual hearing wouldn't be as effective. And I think you know, uh, we, we would acknowledge uh, that and, and, and you know, the various protocols and, and the arbitral institutions do also acknowledge that. I mean, in the SIAC guide, for instance, I think it's, it's, it's necessary uh, for the tribunal to you know, consider whether a virtual hearing uh, is, is appropriate in, in, in those cases. But I do think that, uh, and, and putting my, my proposition hat back on, I do think that it is uh, fair to say that in the vast majority of cases, these sort of technological connection issues don't exist uh, and or can be addressed uh, with you know appropriate protocols uh, and and safeguards and, and and so on. So it's it's you know that there there is of course an, an issue uh, that's out there, but uh, we feel that it can be amply managed uh, and doesn't exist in the vast majority of cases. As Gary says, there's no need to be afraid of this technology. Uh, by and large, uh, this is not just the only game in town. It is the best game in town. Thank you, Joy. John and Rob, your response. That's the digital divide in, in, uh, in action, Edmund. I'm uh, disadvantaged by my lack of access to technology here, but I have now uh, found the mute button and hopefully I'm back with you. Let, let me lead off and then John will, uh, will, will again step in to, um, to, to patch up my errors. 
and certainly this perception of unequal access to technology I do not see as a key plank of our objections to the motion today. As Gary and Joy have both touched on, in the vast majority of cases, um, it is not going to be an issue. Equally though, the, the assumption that because the parties to an arbitration willingly participate in a virtual hearing, um, and the assumption that they are therefore exercising their right to be heard, could be a, a wrong one, conceivably. And that's particularly the case if unequal access to um, technology accessibility is an issue. And there is therefore the scope for that to later become an issue at the enforcement stage, potentially. But I do think those are likely to be cases around the margin. And we do, we do acknowledge that in the vast majority of cases, it's not going to be an issue. John? I don't have that much to add. I, uh, I would, uh, you know, to be very honest with you, uh, when I was listening to the plenary session this morning, um, you know, uh, if uh, Mr. Landell's uh, connection, uh, if there was an issue, that would have been helpful the motion. But just the fact that he said something like that, and the fact that that, that you have to worry about that, uh, shows that it, that um, uh, a remote or a virtual connection or internet connection type of, uh, of hearing is not as effective as an in-person hearing. Thanks. Thank you, John. Okay, um, I'm going to have to combine some questions, and this question is going to be uh, posed to the proposition only. Um, I'm just going to cut from a, a couple of questions. Do you not think it is helpful to see the facial expressions of the witnesses while cross-examining in virtual hearings, you may not be able to see clearly due to the quality of the camera. In fact, it's even difficult to see clearly while using quality cameras like yours. And then somebody else asked, how would virtual hearings take into account blind persons vis-a-vis e-documents? Over to the proposition. Just very quickly and then Joy can, can follow up. In, in the, the vast majority of cases, again, cameras, including the camera on my laptop, not a fancy camera, do perfectly well in displaying facial expressions. We could not only see facial expressions, but the patterns on people's shorts and um, other parts of their costumes. Um, if one can do that, then certainly one can um, determine witnesses' credibility. As we mentioned in, in opening, in fact, one <clears throat> can can assess credibility better in many respects in a virtual hearing because of the tight focus of the camera on one's face instead of a witness sitting across the hearing room and because of the ability to go back and look at records. Joy, anything to add? Um, yes, just, just adding to that and, and um, I think that, that just a, a lot has been said regarding the effectiveness of cross-examination and, and how, you know, it's, it's not the same as doing it in person. Uh, that may be true, uh, but that doesn't mean that the cross-examination can't be as effective as in person, right? Um, it may be that, that counsel just need to, you know, adapt their style to a slower one that takes, you know, into account these technological lags. And, and possibility of, of you know, uh, the, the, the screen suddenly being turned off or going black occasionally, you know? So, so council just need to adapt their style as, as, as well as uh, being patient uh, with, with, you know, technological glitches. I think uh, as, as uh, both, I think Gary mentioned just now and, and, and I, I took in, in my opening, um, you know, if, if parties actually agree to video recording, uh, tribunals can actually play back the video uh, to you know, examine the witness's demeanor, and and possibly if, if the screen was uh, you know technologically advanced enough, they'd be able to zoom in <laughs> on their expression, right? And and uh, yeah, that that might just be even more effective than than you know relying on on, on the transcript. Uh, so uh, I do feel that uh, the concern regarding the technology and the screens uh, again can be addressed. Uh, they, I, I believe the SOL protocol does uh, give a sort of minimum standards in terms of uh, your, not just the connectivity, but also the, the, uh, the type of screen that, that you ought to have. So I, I, ideally, uh, in a virtual hearing, you would have made uh, those, those uh, provisions already in, in, in advance uh, in your protocol. 
Thank you, Joy. Now, um, we've got a question for the opposition. And again, I'm going to have to sort of summarize the gist of several questions. Um, Can, well, I, there's a question that actually lends itself to this. Can virtual hearings lead to the globalization of law and legal practice? Won't they make enforceability and definition of due process of law and public policy uniform across borders, leading to better international commercial arbitration? Basically, um, won't virtual hearings assist in the globalization of international arbitration and work towards um, people coming together to come up with common norms across jurisdictions uh, uh, on international arbitration. Over to you. So virtual hearings will, will help that, in other words. Do you agree or not? I think it really depends on the jurisdictions. Uh, uh, having um, <clears throat> read a lot of articles on various national courts um, you know, during this pandemic, uh, which courts have, uh, have uh, gone to virtual uh, hearings for both civil and criminal matters. Uh, in Korea, uh, virtual hearings have not been used in the court, and therefore um, uniformity and, and, and globalness of, of how enforceability of these type of uh, uh, um, uh, Hearings uh, really depend, I think, uh, on the uh, on the countries. But uh, I take it that um, uh, you know when when Gary uh, gave us the, the empirical data that many national courts are using a virtual hearings effectively, um, that is a fact. But that doesn't mean that uh, it's as effective as in person hearings. Rob, anything to add to that? Only to, to note, Edmund, that I think there's probably a, an argument that might equally made um, for, for the opposite proposition, i.e. that the absence of physical interaction, the lack of direct physical participation in hearings would be counterproductive to the development of common norms. And in fact, the way to, to, to build that sort of commonality is through having users of arbitration present in the same place at the same time interacting in person. All right. Thank you, Rob. Um, there are quite a few questions and due to the, the shortness of time, I'm just going to summarize uh, finally just one more question for each side to answer. Timekeepers, please one minute each for each side once I finish the question. And the question is, what about enforceability? Um, you have uh, a physical uh, hearing, uh, which is enforceable. Uh, you have a virtual hearing, which might pose enforceability problems in certain jurisdictions. Um, what do you say about the issue of enforceability on each side? Proposition first. Just very quickly. There have been a number of national court decisions, both before and after the pandemic, that have recognized awards and enforced them notwithstanding the use of video conference um, witness testimony, notwithstanding the use of virtual hearings. The confrontation clause case that was quoted by Mr. Palmer from Justice Scalia in the United States was a criminal case having to do with a specific domestic constitutional provision in a very specialized area. Reaching for that sort of exceptional rule um, in this commercial private context, I think demonstrates the, the frailty, the hopelessness, frankly, of arguments that there would be enforceability issues where a tribunal, even over a party's objection, had ordered a virtual hearing. Certainly where both parties had agreed to the virtual hearing, there'd be no issue whatsoever. Thank you, Gary. Rob and John? Uh, even to Briefly, in response, with, without going into too much detail, and, and given it's an SIAC uh, Congress, I can, I, I can mention this. I'm certainly aware of a number of instances at the moment where parties to ICC arbitrations are contesting the powers of the tribunal to, um, to hold virtual hearings on the basis that the ICC rules require, at least under the English version, and I'm aware there are differences depending upon the language of the rules that are used, but um, under the English version, appear to require an in-person hearing. 
And regardless of whichever way those arguments are resolved by the tribunal, those will then no doubt be rolled out again at the enforcement stage, rightly or wrongly, as a further way of prolonging the process. Yet another roadblock, we say, to efficient arbitration process that is provided by um, virtual hearings. Thank you, Rob. Right, everybody is, has had their say right now. So you are going to have the, your say as the audience. We are going to flash a poll on screen. You'll have one minute to select um, your uh, preferred outcome, and then we'll have a look at how people voted. Can we have the poll on now, please? Right, we're going to end the polling. And could we please have the, I'm gonna share the results. I'm not sure if everybody can see the results of the poll. Can, can you see the results, um, participants? Rob, Joy, Gary? Are you able to, to see the uh, percentages? Oh, good. I can see them. Okay, well, um, it looks like just by a very narrow margin of 54% to 46%, the opposition has it. Um, the slight majority uh, says that virtual hearings are not as effective as in-person hearings. Um, that's unfortunately the result for one side, fortunately for the other side. Congratulations to all the speakers and wonderful performances. Um, and I, I'm sure we all learned uh, a huge uh, amount about virtual hearings from the discussion we had. So thank you very much. Once again, it only re remains for me to thank uh, our debaters, Joy, Gary, Rob, and John. And thank you for listening in to this debate. Uh, please st uh, stay tuned for the rest of today's um, uh, virtual congress. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for that exciting debate and congratulations to the opposition.